that we all share, which is golf. The the optimal uh, shape of the golf ball. So I'll, I'll let them take it from here. Thank you, Father Laracy. Joe, if you just want to share the screen. Perfect. Let me get that up for you guys. Awesome. OK, hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming today to watch our presentation. So Joe and I researched turbulence and its mathematical impact on golf balls. And then here's our abstract for us. And then our outline for today, first we're going to start off with nonlinear partial differential equations, going into the Navier-Stokes equation specifically, then talk about computational fluid dynamics, and then our golf ball analysis, and then our conclusion. So first off, we have nonlinear partial differential equations. And just as Father Laracy said, we, a lot of this, our course, we deal with ODEs and different methods to solving them. So we expanded into PDEs uh, with, with equations like Navier-Stokes for this project. So before we get into what a nonlinear PDE is, what is a partial differential equation? A partial differential equation is an equation that shows relationships between multiple partial derivatives of a multivariable function. And then a nonlinear PDE is when terms involved in the equation are nonlinear. Because of the fact that terms involved in the are partial derivatives and are nonlinear, they are very difficult to study and solve at times. The properties of PDEs can be defined, but they change depending on the equation. This constant change makes solving each type of PDE completely different. This in turn makes it difficult to prove whether a solution exists or not for a PDE. So here we have two general forms of PDEs, the first one, the first order, and then we have the second order. We're not going to go into too much detail right now about the exact details about them, but as you can see, as we move from the first to the second, it becomes more complex, more terms are introduced, and this is a trend we'll see as we continue on. So as I was saying, the complexity of the second order compared to the first order shows just how difficult PDEs are to solve as they quickly go up, as they quickly change and grow more as order goes up. This is one of the reasons as to why they are so difficult to solve. We only showed the first and second order P general forms of PDEs, but this trend continues as well for third order and higher orders as well. As more and more variables are introduced with higher orders, more and more chaos is a result. The increasing chaos is a big cause as to why even when PDEs are solvable, they usually are only solved through computers. When it comes to partial differential equations, there are many realms of math that they are used to explore. They help to give a mathematical explanation, understanding of everyday life events and actions, uh, but there are some additional challenges that come along with them. As said before, chaos comes around due to not being able to calculate them in their increasing order. And the number and values of the equations are constantly changing, and this greatly impacts the chance of solving them. And then PDA, PDEs also need to be broken up into multiple equations when solving simultaneously, which makes it difficult as well. Now we're going to get into Navier-Stokes, which is a specific type of PDE. So just a little history of the Navier-Stokes equation before we dive into it a little deeper. So the first thoughts of the Navier-Stokes was seen through Newton's second law of fluid motion. And the first time it was seen as a full function, uh, partial, partial function was when Euler uh, composed it. The main people who contributed to the Navier-Stokes equation were Claude Louis Navier and George Gabriel Stokes. Uh, they did not work on it together at the same time, but at different times. Navier did the majority of his work in the year 1822, and Stokes did most of his work between the years of 1842 and 1850. The Navier-Stokes equations are partial differential equations, which are all about the motion of fluids. And Ludwig Prandtl helped modernize and put the Navier-Stokes equation into how we see it today. So here we have the uh, Euler's version of it and then the Navier-Stokes equation we know today. As you can see, there's a lot of similarities between the two. First, you see there's the U term, which is the fluid velocity vector. There's also the fluid pressure, which is the big P variable. There's the little p variable, which is the fluid de uh, density, and the delta, which is the gradient differential operator. The one main difference, though, between the two is the Navier-Stokes equation involves viscosity and Euler's uh, doesn't, and the viscosity, specifically its kinematic viscosity, which is the V term. So when solving problems with Navier-Stokes, it usually stays in the nonlinear form, and being in the nonlinear form makes it difficult to solve and at times impossible. 
This is where turbulence comes into play, and we'll go into, into that more later on. Currently, the only solutions we know from Navier-Stokes are those in the two-dimensional space. When it switches into third-dimensional space, there's a, a, the amount of unknowns increases dramatically, which leads to chaos and turbulence coming into play. And then there's also a million dollar question revolving the Navier-Stokes equation because there's so much uncertainty around it that the, the problem, uh, there's a problem involving it. And the question is, in three dimensional systems of equations, do the solutions always exist? This question's not, not even asking for uh, answer, it's just asking if a solution exists. And this still is unsolved, just showing how difficult it is to uh, do it. And it's a big part in understanding turbulence. And then for applications, there's these are just some general applications that Navier Stokes is in everyday life, from weather forecasts to water currents to airplane design, blood flow, ship design, and sports, just like the golf ball, which Joe will take over with now. Thank you so much, Brian. So the Reynolds number is another significant part of this uh, fluid dynamics. So the Reynolds number, not named after Professor Reynolds, uh, is the measure of inertial forces versus the viscous forces. And it basically predicts the transition from your laminar to your turbulent flow. So if you're not familiar with those terms, the laminar flow is where there's a low Reynolds number and it's that smooth uh, current, where turbulent, if you're ever in an airplane, is more chaotic. So if you look below, that's a visual that we created in Mathematica. And you may be wondering what all those colors mean. Um, so it's essentially a, a smooth ball on the left, that's that white circle, and it's in this airflow that's coming from the left. And you can see where the airflow is going um, on the right in all the different colors. So that laminar airflow, if you look at the top, is where the air is still attached to that, that ball. But once it moves off that ball, it goes to that turbulent flow. And you can see that more closely in this other visual we created in Mathematica, where as the Reynolds number increases, you can see that that wind, that fluid coming from the left, uh, gets more turbulent, that chaos goes behind. So you look at 40, uh, the air current is pretty uh, consistent with the ball, but then once it gets to 150, you can see that it starts to detach and there's that turbulence behind it. By the time it hits 500, there's so much turbulence behind it and that's going to affect the drag coefficient, which will draw the this ball and whatever this ball is used for um, not to go as far, just because that drag coefficient is behind it. And to understand this further, we want to create a simulation in computational fluid dynamics, which is just a fun word of saying a mathematical model online. It's basically using the fluid flows in a mathematical model where, where we look at the numerical analysis, the data structures, and it's called CFT because computational fluid dynamics is a lot to say in a presentation. And you may be wondering, what other ways are there? So of course there's numerical, so we can go to a blackboard or a whiteboard and just go crazy with some formulas, but that does take some time. It does allow us to explore a lot, but it does take some time out of uh, our analysis. There's also the experimental version where we could simulate our own environment in the physical realm and really have this model and create this atmosphere. But the difficulty with that is one, it takes a lot of money and time to build those models. And two, you can only test for what you know you wanna test for. You can only build a model based on what you specifically wanna look for in a model. So computational kind of branches those two fields together because it allows the accurate and the explorative aspects of the numerical analysis and techniques with also having that accurate and uh, detailed design optimization from the experimental version. So when Brian and I went to apply this to the golf ball analysis, we hope to have a simulation done for you guys so you could see uh, how the dimples play a role in the golf ball uh, aerodynamics. Unfortunately, we had some difficulty getting some software together. All the free academic versions uh, would stop us at the point when we want to start a simulation. So we applied for some academic grants to get the professional versions from those softwares, and hopefully by this time next week, we can have a final simulation done. But just so you can get a little taste of it, here is a golf ball that we put in a software called SimScale. You can see there's plenty of dimples on it. <laughs> and then we put it in this box, and you might be like, why is there a box around this golf ball? Essentially, our goal is to simulate the environment inside that box, because it's dissecting the golf ball in half. So half of the golf ball is inside the box, the other half is outside. So inside the box is where that fluid flow will occur, and we'll be having a 2D animation from the center of the ball where you can tell where, where that airflow is going and where the currents are going. And here's another image of what we hope to show in a simulation next week. Uh, and if you look on the left, that's the smooth ball. And as the air goes around it, like I showed before, that separation of that laminar flow occurs, and that causes this thick wake behind the, the ball. 
So that causes it to not go as far because there's a negative force on it. When a golf ball, that airflow is going in and out of each dimple. So whenever the airflow wants to go off that ball, it finds a dimple to go down and up. And that causes that separation to occur a lot later. You can see where that separation occurs in the golf ball. And that causes a thinner wake, a smaller wake. So that allows the golf balls to go a lot further. And I find it very interesting that this occurred when, in the 1900s, when all the, the rich people were playing golf, they all wanted a brand new golf ball every time they played. And they realized that the people who had the scuffed golf, uh, golf balls were going a lot further than them. And they were like, what, how does this happen? Like, I'm paying for a new one every time. And I think that's very interesting in how the dimples came to be, but just noticing how the scuff marks in a golf ball uh, improved its performance. So just some, some conclusions for us. We were able to demonstrate that the dimples affect the aerodynamics of golf balls uh, by decreasing that drag coefficient. And when that drag coefficient is decreased, the golf ball can go a further distance. And just that we hope by next week, we're able to have that simulation completed so you can see with all our fancy colors uh, what we we're trying to, trying to present. But thank you so much for listening. And we want to send a special thank you to Father Laracy for all his help. I don't know if any of you guys have ever worked with Father Laracy in research, but as soon as you tell him what you're looking for, you're bound to get like three emails from him with all the research and resources to kind of direct you in the right direction. So thank you, Father Laracy, for all your kindness and support, especially with this week uh, when we're having difficulty with the software. And here's our bibliography. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Joseph and Brian. Great work. And as, as Joseph um, alluded to at the, uh, I guess the, the closing departmental colloquium, there will be an opportunity for the students to go into greater detail um, with their projects. And uh, in this particular case, uh, God willing, we'll have all the licenses worked out for the simulation software because they're actually, they've gotten involved in some really professional simulation software uh, that's used in the nuclear engineering industry. Um, so as you can imagine, it's it's a little trickier to get those licenses, but we're working hard on that. So uh, I think, uh, Professor Wager, do we have time for a question or two now? Or, or no? Um, maybe just one question. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. Great, great work. Thank you. I guess I'll jump right in. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm so excited to introduce Elizabeth Buskis, uh, our senior financial mathematics major. Over the last two years, Lizzie and I have worked alongside other Seton Hall students and students at Stevens Institute of Technology um, under the direction of Dr. Thomas Lannan from Stevens and myself. Um, we have been working on research, investigating different calibration techniques for short-term regime switching volatility models. Um, this project is part of her, uh, Lizzie's CBL scholarship and her honors thesis. So Lizzie, I will now turn it over to you and for you to tell us about short-term regime switching option pricing. Thank you, Dr. Luttrell. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, good. I had to put in headphones because they have spring fling outside right outside of my window and they're playing really loud music. So I just wanted to be sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Luttrell. My name is Elizabeth Puskus and uh, I am a CBL scholar. Uh, today, I will be talking about short-term regime switching option pricing, um, That a project that I worked alongside Steven's student, Leo, um, as well as Dr. Luttrell and also Dr. Lon and F. Stevens as well. So the objective of my project was to test different calibrations of short-term regime switching volatility and to get the predicted prices from these calibrations of the options um, and compare them to the observed bid-ask spread in order to test how well our model is performing. Oh, so I said a lot of finance terms. So what do these finance terms exactly mean? So starting with options, the subject of our of our study, options are a uh, stock derivative, which means that uh, basically it's a product where whose value depends on the underlying asset, which in this case is the stock. 
Uh, it is the right, but not necessarily the obligation to buy or sell the stock at a certain price. Um, so the bid ask spread is what we're using as our point of comparison. And this is the difference between the highest buying price and the lowest selling price of the option. The black shoals model is kind of the foundation of all the all the calculations that we're doing for uh, this project. It is the it produces the theoretic the theoretical fair value of an option based on these parameters: uh, time, the stock price at the time, the strike price, which is basically uh, the price at which uh, the option can buy or sell the stock. Uh, then we have our interest rate and most importantly, uh, the volatility, which what we're looking at uh, is what we're using, the parameter that we're using uh, in order to conduct the regime switching. Uh, this process uh, kind of involved first taking a historical value of histor uh, historical option prices that we looked at minute level frequencies. Then from here, we divided the historical data into regimes based on like groups of volatility. And from these different levels of volatility, we then put them into our Black-Scholes uh, model. And in addition to that, we also used a further, I guess, more probability standpoint where we took into account how much time until expiration we had uh, in order to uh, basically weight the regimes as far as how the model will implement them. So the two pieces of data that we really took into account first is the historical data that I've already mentioned. Uh, we took into account both dividend and non-dividend paying stocks, but the thing that we we're looking for most importantly was that they were frequently traded. And as I mentioned before, we looked at minute, minute historical data in order to form our regimes and then uh, the weight of our regimes. Um, and then we took some real time data. We looked at uh, about 16 to 17 different countries, uh, not countries, companies, uh, based on how much historical data that we had. And uh, what we have what we pulled was the, the strikes of those options of those companies that were within 5% of the current stock price uh, because we figured those would be more frequently traded and more, vol uh, more volume there. We pulled data every five minutes and in order to um, implement our model. So here are some of the pricing comparisons that we found. Uh, the black lines that you see represent the observed bid ask spread uh, that we, the bid and the ask prices that we pulled directly um, in real time that I mentioned before. Uh, the blue line that you see is our calibration model that we used um, five, five day trailing. So we took into account five days before uh, the expiration. And then the red line that you see here is a typical 30 day historical, but we use the, the Black Scholes model kind of in its purest form where we did just one volatility over the 30 days uh, and taking into account those log returns. Interestingly enough, uh, we saw that our calibration performed differently based on uh, the different companies. What you see here are three different companies where um, I pulled the strikes that were kind of the closest to the current stock uh, stock prices overall. Um, for Alibaba that we see here all the way to the left, um, the Black Shoals and the Bid Ask were kind of aligned, but ours was much lower. And honestly, when we first ran this, um, this simulation, we saw that uh, our calibration prices were much, much lower or tended to be lower than our bid ask. And so later we added in the Black Shoals in its purest form um, to, comp to add another point of comparison. And what we found was that we are still pricing a little lower than Black Shoals, but ultimately for some like Facebook that you see, we were really close. 
So that takes us on to further exploration. Uh, taking into account what results that we found so far, um, one thing would be to continue to develop different calibrations. Do we go back five days? Do we go back less? Do we go back more? Um, another thing that we took into account was that given uh, kind of politics and what's going on overseas, as well as the pandemic, the market might not necessarily be the most stable. And so we'd be interested in looking at what our ca calibrations would look like when the market is relatively more stable. I would like to extend these thank yous and open for questions. Thank you. Excellent job, Lizzie. Do we have some time for a couple questions? Yeah, I think so. OK, I see um, Dr. Marlowe has a question. What was the duration of these options typically? I mean, are we talking 30 day options or? Oh, we pulled options. Uh, we pulled real time data um, for the options expiring within a week. So if they're expiring on uh, Friday or for the data that I showed you, that was actually right before Easter. So those um, options expired Thursday of that week and the data that I showed you was Monday of that week. Right, the intent is to <clears throat> look only at short term instruments so that we can uh, neglect the interest rate because the interest rate over five days is negligible anyway. Thank you. By the way, that is Dr. Lanan from Stevens, who's in on the call as well, and one of the advisors to the project. Uh, welcome, Dr. Lanan. Thanks, sorry, my webcam is acting up. <laughs> I see another question. Whose hand is that? Sorry, I'm scrolling. Dr. Masterson, yes. Yes, uh, the Charles uh, model was uh, devised in 1973 by Fisher Black. Myron Scholes, and um, this was used uh, to test as a, a real, given a real time test with the uh, by, uh, by uh, I guess it was uh, Merton and others, uh, long term capital 1998 and needed a bailout by the Federal Reserve. Um, my question is. Um, as you are describing these these uh, options, were they all short short term options or long term options? Because I think that that their attempt to use this was proven to be fallacious. We used short term options, no long term options. OK, thank you. think that is all. So I think I, Father Laracy, I believe I turn it back over to you. Thank you, everyone. Actually, I believe Dr. Ananda is next. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. So cybersecurity, as you all know, that it's an area that is evolving. Um, a couple of my students are doing their research in cybersecurity area, especially in social engineering. And I would like to introduce uh, my students, Jasel Garcia and Paulo Buru. Uh, they would be presenting uh, our research on social engineering attacks. So this is a common problem that all of us are facing and we will uh, students will show with one of the social engineering attacks called a phishing with a live demonstration and they have been doing a lot of research on this topic and they did it in, on a short duration. They have tried multiple attacks, password attacks, distributed denial of service attacks, privilege escalation attacks and so on. We almost tried 30 different tools and multiple attacks. So uh, Jassel and Paul, over to you. Thank you, Professor. Mm -hmm. I'm going to share my screen now.
Okay. Uh, is everyone able to see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, like Professor was saying, our topic is over cybersecurity, more focusing on social engineering attacks. And our short research was on finding commonalities in social engineering attacks on e commerce shopping platforms and online gaming platforms. So, my name is Josiel, and my partner over here is Paul, and our professor is Professor Anand. All right, so our agenda for this presentation, uh, we're going to briefly go over our introduction, describing what exactly is social engineering, uh, go over our proposed approach. Uh, we're also going to be doing a short live demo on a phishing attack and then go over our conclusions and propose future work. Uh, in order for us to better understand exactly the attacks that occur for users online um, and social engineering, we'd have to define what it is. Simply said, social engineering is basically what certain users will use to manipulate people into performing actions online that allow them to divulge uh, confidential information, be it usernames, passwords, credit card information, and other uh, attainable information about their banking, family, life, etc. And of course, by doing this, you'd be committing fraud and basically using different deception tactics and tools on your devices and machines in order to access computer systems and get this valuable information. So what the objective of our presentation is simply to underline the importance of the fact that social engineering is becoming all the more prevalent and also take a look at the factors as to why it is uh, people nowadays are facing more social engineering attacks why it is we're more at harm and more at risk of losing our data and having our data uh, perpetuated online. Jasul and I, we decided to take a look specifically at two user groups, which includes online gamers and online shoppers, and take a look at the vulnerabilities that they face um, as a social engineering attacker would perceive them, as well as see the commonalities and how people would use particular techniques to take their information and use it to their own benefit. And on top of that, we'd like to provide future work towards developing a, a risk scoring metric that can help underline or more so outline to the next user whether or not it's safe to shop on a particular website or to browse and play a particular game on a different website as well. So the slide right here basically is a depiction of the social engineering life cycle. This is simply what a social engineering attacker will go through prior to, during and after the event of actually exploiting an attack on a victim. They start off with the pre-engagement, which is simply identifying the target and basically working to find out who exactly they're targeting and what information they want to gather from said person. Of course, in establishing the relationship, which is next, they have to tailgate the target and develop a trust. One thing that we took note of from a lot of the research we conducted from a few sources online goes to share that the social presence is one thing that helps uh, data phishing tactics to work, being that advertisements, ad pop-ups, websites, emails in your spam folder, for example, that we all receive are like one of the most prevalent examples. We then have the obtaining information section, which is simply where the social engineering attacker will use different search engines, social networks, and different platforms on their machine in order to develop closer interactions with the said user and in doing so, they're able to exploit the victim and obtain the information that they desire. Um, here are a few bullet pointed uh, options and uh, of some of the different tools and things that they would use in the pre-engagement. Um, one example could include a weak website or a mirrored website. In a lot of cases for data phishing uh, techniques, a lot of uh, social engineering attackers will implement a website or connect to their server and basically mirror a website to make it appear as it's YouTube, Google, Facebook, your Gmail, or anything else. And you might not be as knowledgeable or knowing that you're entering your information into a false website, for example. They use different tools on their devices, such as Nmap, Angry IP Scan, Wireshark, Nikito, as you can see listed under the number two step right there. These are several of the different machines that they'd use in order to develop a closer connection uh, to the server or to the person's machine. And exploiting the information can be done using Metasploit, for example, which is how they attain some of this information and use it to their benefit. What's next is, of course, the parameters identified. This is kind of like step one for an attacker. 
understanding who exactly they're trying to attack. In the case of Jasiel and I, we wanted to take a look at people who shop online and people who play video games online. Um, a lot of the research that we had conducted um, amidst ourselves with our peers and family, as well as our instructor, uh, Professor Anand, the demographic goes to show that the majority of people in the last three to four years of the United States who uh, are frequent online shoppers are under the age of 25. And a lot of online gamers today are typically from the ages of 18 to 21. So basically people are age. And on top of there being factors of having vulnerabilities to our machines, uh, the social presence and the perceived security risk of the said website or gaming platform is measured differently by everybody. I might notice the risk of shopping on a particular website and somebody else may not as well. Other factors could include maybe pressure or the weakness. Um, one article that we did take a look at went to share that a lot of social engineering data phishing attacks occur in the United States in the months of November and December, which a lot of us know is holiday season. So you can imagine a lot of people going through the rush or uh, trying to buy all their Christmas gifts early um, could possibly be come across a website that's fraudulent and put their information on there. Um, and of course, with parameters as such, we want to be able to go on and continue our work to arrive at a risk score that can better help users in the future. So now we'll take a look at a live demonstration of how this could work. All right, so begin before we begin the demonstration, I'd just like to announce that this is a uh, demonstration over a phishing attack where we're going to have two machines, one attacking machine, one victim machine. Uh, just a quick disclaimer, this is just for education purposes, so I have skipped a few steps so that it cannot be like duplicated outside. Okay, so on the right side here is this is our example of a social attacker and here the attacker has created a clone of it could be any website. In this case, it's a Facebook website. So what they've done, they clone a website and what they've done here is send an email. So it's what's send an email with the link to Facebook on the left side here is the victim machine. So here's an example of email, which I'm sure many have seen before saying, you know, you're a winner, sign into your Facebook and log in and things like that, claim your prize. Now, the thing is, if you hover over the link that looks like Facebook in the bottom left here, you see it doesn't actually go to Facebook.com. It actually is linked to the social engineers attackers IP address. So in this case, if we click onto it, Again, it looks like it directs us to Facebook login page, but if you look at the top here, it says it's not secure because we're not actually on Facebook's login page. This is just a clone website that leads us to the social engineering attacker's uh, IP address, like I mentioned earlier. So if we insert a fake username and fake password, here we're going to say password123. We try to log in, nothing happens for the victim side. However, the social engineering attacker has been listening this whole time and waiting to gather this information. So if I scroll down here, I can highlight that I, this attacker has, was able to gather the email and the password from the Facebook login page. And this is an example of a phishing attack. Now we'll go back to our presentation. All right. so. During our study, we have conducted several social engineering attacks within our research team. Uh, we've gone studies over 10 different vulnerabilities uh, based off the OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities articles. Uh, here are just some of the social engineering uh, methods that we have done and looked at. And for our conclusion, so we've noticed that there have been several vulnerabilities that we found through different articles and studies between shoppers and gamers. Um, they tend to trust well, when it comes to gamers, they tend to trust online strength, online gamers because of sort of the cooperation that's built within games and shoppers. They tend to trust sort of websites whenever they become stressed and things like that and continue on with the online gaming since there's so much competition in gaming. Sometimes gamers want to get the edge above other gamers and sometimes what that means is they'll try to cheat, go to different, you know, sort of not so safe websites to download for example, hacks that they think would give them an advantage, but in doing so, they would download, for example, some, some uh, malicious software. In addition to what Jaziel has shared earlier, 
um, and as I had mentioned earlier as well, the perception of the security risk as well as the social presence of these platforms are all perceived differently by different users. So what we came to realize through a lot of our research is it's very important that we understand the psychological aspect of this research as not every user will see the risk in visiting a particular website. And similar to what Jazil had shared that a particular user may want an added advantage in the game and will go through to visit a website or a platform that's supposed to provide them um, in game enhancements or features to help them perform better or be first all the time. And that's not necessarily the most secure way to shop online or to have played your games. Um, there is no perfect software solution to social engineering attacks as such, and there are many different other ways that they work, including spyware. Some of us may have come across of these a few times where you may visit a corrupted or somewhat illegal website and have ads pop up and we have to continue to close tabs to get to the main page. That's like another example which we had not provided a demonstration for. So uh, in order to work towards mitigating attacks as these, we can better inform users on social engineering attacks such as data phishing that we might not be as knowledgeable about. And to move forward, um, introducing a scoring approach would definitely help people identify the risks that they could meet um, in working on things as such. Um, of course, uh, keeping into mind something like the variance inflation factor, this was a metric that was instated by some research compiled at Butler University, um, which is simply to measure the social presence rating of a particular platform compared to the perceived security risk. And this could be used to let users know when visiting a website, hey, this website has a risk of eight out of 10. It can more so better advise someone to not shop through there or not to play video games through that source as well. And if you have any other questions, comments, and concerns, please let us know. Thank you. Thank you. That was that a was great presentation, Paul and Jensel. We have, we some, have questions. some questions. Uh, uh, Professor Masterson. I think, I, see a, hand, yeah. I, know. I think that might have been an old hand. Okay. I, just so I, I, I guess the real issue is once you have this scoring system, how do you keep that from becoming a social engineering attack itself as somebody spams it or somebody? Good, no, good question. Um, I believe with how we would have worked to implement a scoring, a risk scoring system onto a platform, uh, maybe have it uh, work as an indicator for a said user on a website or through a gaming uh, provider's link, for example. Um, we would definitely, of course, have to have it be secured, something that cannot be re implemented or re or more so access through a different server. Um, and of course, there, there has to be some essence of morality and making sure that us users or the admin is unable to skew the numbers or necessarily mess with the system in order to perpetuate the idea that certain links are safe to visit and to shop on as compared to unsafe. You might even have to go to a dual factor authentication just to load the scoring system. Yeah, definitely. That's that's definitely important. There's definitely a lot of factors that we uh, plan to look into, search more. Are there any other Good job, guys? Nice, nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other questions for us? No, I think thank you so much, Jassel. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So the next student. Um, OK, next I would like to introduce um, uh, my student Eden Olri. Uh, he would be presenting our research work on penetration testing, especially network penetration testing and vulnerability analysis. And he is also he's traveling. Actually, he's uh, going for soccer match for Seton Hall University. Um, so he will also uh, show live demonstration to compromise a machine 
and uh, thank you Eden for joining. You can proceed. Yeah. First, uh, so thank you and good afternoon everyone. I just want to say from before, if there is some cut in the network or updating, I'm sorry about that. I'm not aware of the soccer match at the evening talk. Um, okay, so. You might want to increase your volume just a touch. Okay, okay, you're right. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. So my presentation is uh, from cybersecurity class, uh, and it talks about the uh, vulnerability analysis and scoring of networks. Um, the presenters of today will be me. I'm a, an international student from uh, Israel, Tel Aviv, and Kyle Courtney is my partner that uh, unfortunately couldn't make it today due to family or emergency. So I will take the role of be the only presenter. Um, and thanks a lot for our instructor, Professor Anna. So our agenda for this presentation will be one at the beginning of the after that four minutes of the research approach, um, a live demonstration that's going to take three minutes, and in the end, we're going to show the conclusion and our future work. So the complexity of networks and the large number of new vulnerabilities has become a big issue in the cyber world in the last few years. This issue demands more strategies and techniques to make the security of the cyber world safer. One of the most important keys to cybersecurity is utilizing the many different methods of penetration testing. Our days, every organization needs a team of penetration testers that could be identifying vulnerabilities in the networks, in the systems, the hosts, the devices, etc. Our objective uh, will be identifying what are the security weaknesses in the machine, in the networks, in the softwares, and thereby detect the vulnerable systems. After that, we will provide a risk score for vulnerable system based on the intensity of the vulnerability that rated between low, moderate, and high. As well, we are performing a white box testing to protect the network and generate the risks analysis report. In this demonstration, we are going to act as ethical hackers as we are going as we are getting an authorization from Seton Hall University to perform the penetration testings on our own personal victim network and machine. Okay, so we are divided our assessment approach into six phases. Um, the first phase will be the pre-engagement. And as a team, we plan, we plan and chose a target, which is a vulnerable machine. We do research about the target, what are the tools, what are the attacks, what are we going to use, what will be the budget, and what is the time that has been provided for us. The second phase will be to identify the reachable system and who is the host. Also, to report scanning, we see what are the port numbers, what are the versions available, and what is the host fingerprint. Uh, we gather all this information through the tools that listed here on the right. Um, you can see Google, Recon, Showdown, AdMap, Google Dorks, and who is. Um, phase three for us will be recovery. And for that, what we're going to do will be to discover the data that we're getting from the scanning. The stuff we are doing and achieving from it, this is an liberation or the vulnerability assessment. We are creating also a checklist. Uh, we are choosing a tool from the list to perform the vulnerability scanning as the tools that you can see listed down here. Um, I can say the top would be the, the Nmap, Zenmap, NSLUCA, the Ping, Wireshark, Nikto, John the Reaper, etc. You can see down here. And then after that, we need to schedule the scanning of the identified target. For the fourth phase will be the exploitation. Uh, in this part, we execute exploits, which means gain access of the target host. We can see it when our IP is the same as the host. Um, and in phase five will be the, our result analysis. 
where we're actually crossing references and comparing results across the different tools we scanned with. And for the last phase uh, will be the report, the risk score. And after having a deep analysis, we report it to the instructor after a comprehensive report to mitigate discovered vulnerabilities. We are using the scale risk scores that we are analyzed under the following buckets. Like I said before, we have low, moderate, elevate and high. And this report will be generated as either a PDF format or a CSV format. Uh, now we're going for a live demonstration. Um, so in this demonstration, we'll be making use of uh, several tools that we used in class. Uh, we're going to use the Kali Linux, uh, the Metasploiter machine, which would be our victim. We're going to use Go. Uh, before using this, it's important to say that this demonstration is for education purposes only, and this method uses in its demonstration should not be trying at home and build machines that you do not have permission to do this for. So what we can see here on the right uh, would be our exploitable machine. And here on the kind of the top, you can see the IP with the Y92. And on the left is our Kali Linux, uh, which would be the attacker machine, which we're gonna use. Um, I already did the end map before because the scanning takes a bit of time. You can see here on top, I did the end map with the IP of the victim. And now we are keep continuing. So exploit with the version of the port 21 of the TCP over here on the top left. Yes, it's great. And now I am right here in the set console. Thank you. It's starting. Yeah, now we are ready to go. Um, now we are going to search for the version. So and now we're going to use the exploit. Okay, and now we're going. What we're going to do? The next step will be to set the our host as the victim IP. So I'm going to use now the victim IP that you can see on the right of the net exploitable. I will set our host. And right now we're going to exploit it. I want to mark a shell, you can see it. And in a second, it will be better to watch. Yes, and now when I'm doing the unf config, we hear that our IP is the same as the victim, and we gain access. On this. Um, so for the results, uh, we can see that the following tests were conducted with the metasploitable machine, like I just said, and the methodology at arrive of the module scoring in progress. Uh, you can see here the report. Um, we we picked the top eight. Um, like you can see, it's been rated from low to high, there's like medium as well. You can see the test name, here's the description, for example, the tools we used, um, uh, the, all the ones that we were, that I was saying before in the faces, we used the Nmap. Um, so this is a 
the description of everything. And for our conclusion and future work, um, we are actually currently co co working on the risk factor analysis and scoring, and we will be continuing to explore uh, more additional finishing for listening. My accent was okay. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Eden. That was a great presentation. Any questions from the audience? And uh, prior to that, I'm sorry about the network issues. You know, last minute, one of the students, he got some uh, family emergency, so he couldn't join. Thank you, Eden, for taking time and, uh, you know, presenting. Uh, any sure. questions, anybody? Yes. Yes, Professor. As much a comment as a question, it I was been reading Bruce Schneier's click here to kill everybody. And one of the issues is that with the modern Internet plus Internet of Things, you do not necessarily have to start by compromising the computer you're aiming at. I posted a, an interesting link that he, he referenced of a casino data uh, computer that was compromised by going through a fish tank connected to the Internet. So that's just a comment. I'm not asking you to okay. address it, but it's just sure. a just shows that you know, vulnerabilities can be anywhere. OK, thank you. Any other questions, anybody? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And I wanted to tell about my students. They are doing their research paper um, on the vulnerability analysis. They are going to present on May 27th uh, on IEEE conference. Two teams they are going to present. Yeah. Thank you so much. So, um, we we'll turn the turn over to Father Laracy. He's going to talk. Uh, we have his senior project students and also uh, the rest of the junior seminar students. Father Laracy. Thank you, Dr. Sackman. So uh, I had the privilege of working with uh, Don Telesio and William Mole this year for their senior honors research. Uh, they worked very hard, very well. And uh, so well, in fact, that they received a, a small grant from the NASA New Jersey Space Consortium, and they're presenting at this time uh, at Rutgers University. So that's that's what necessitated them to to pre-record their presentation. Uh, but like the junior seminar students, Donna and Will will be um, available at the department colloquium on May 6th uh, to go into more detail and to respond um, to questions. Uh, so now we can uh, listen to their uh, brief summary of, of their work. And can you guys just give me a thumbs up that you could hear their sound when when it starts, just so I know? Thanks. Sure. Start whenever. Okay. <clears throat> can you hear that? Uh, today we will be presenting our math honors capstone research in dynamical astronomy in the quest for planet nine. So on uh, today's agenda, we'll be talking about dynamical systems, the origins of Planet Nine conjecture and criticism, reevaluating the system, and applying dynamics in the quest for Planet Nine. So for uh, some mathematical foundations, a dynamical systems studies are the foundation of all orbital mechanics dating back to Kepler and Lagrange. Dynamical formulations define a state space, set of times, and an evolution rule. The Kepler problem is a special case of the two-body problem in which the two bodies interact by a central force that varies in strength as the inverse square of the distance between them, creating the basis for Newton's laws of motion. So in the early 1800s, J. L. Lagrange studied the three-body problem by considering the initial positions and velocities of three-point masses according to Newton's laws. So unlike the two-body problem, no closed-form solution exists when the third body is introduced. 
Uh, Lagrange also studied the stabilities of planetary orbits and discovered the existence of Lagrangian points, which are five points of equilibrium for small mass objects under the influence of two massive orbiting bodies. Um, in the corner here, you could see a visualization of the Lagrange points in a system. Uh, Hamiltonian mechanics provide a means by which solutions to a system with three bodies can be found. Sir William Rowan Hamilton developed a geom geometric techniques for studying the properties of dynamical systems, permitting a wider class of coordinates than Newton's or Lagrange's. Hamiltonians describe the system in terms of components of momentum and coordinates of space and time while still considering the conservation of energy of the system. So the Hamiltonian system for the three body problem has nine degrees of freedom that can be at best reduced to four degrees using all 10 classical integrals of motion. So due to the unpredictable nature of the three body problem, uh, closed form solutions are unlikely to be found. So because of this, a uh, numerical approximations are the best approach we can employ. So one technique is the use of series expansions, which yields ap approximate solutions that converge slowly, limiting their usefulness. And another approach um, is to treat the system as a restricted uh, three body problem, which is simplifying the problem by assuming that there are two large bodies that revolve in circular orbits on a plane and treating the third body as a point mass. So then we'll talk about uh, CAM theory and chaos prov that pr they provide a model for thinking about celestial dynamics. So regarding the dynamics of a nearly integrable Hamiltonian system, the Colmore Grove Arnold Moser CAM theory provides conditions under which a chaotic system is, re is restricted in extent. So this often arises in cases involving persistence of uh, quasi uh, periodic motions under small perturbations. So CAM theory was applied to the solar system and other end body problems, but the problem is found to degenerate um, for numbers of bodies that exceed three. So the theorem is the basis for understanding chaos and periodic motion pertaining to um, orbital perturbation and dynamical systems theory. So chaotic systems have sensitive dependence on initial conditions, creating a large geometric growth for a relative small relatively small change in time. So a uh, planetary orbits are chaotic when evaluated over large time scales. Um, the whole solar system possesses a Lyapunov time in the range of two to 230 million years, despite being stable for the relatively small time scale over which it is observed by humanity. Um, so now we're gonna get into some background about the Kuiper belt and a new planet. So the motion of the Kuiper belt objects or KBOs led to, to the first discussion of Planet Nine. So in 2014, Trujillo and Shepard observed 13 of the most withdrawn objects in the Kuiper Belt. These objects with respect to an ambiguous feature shared a similar orbital pattern obtained to the implementation of the COSI mechanism, so, which is the most uh, notable dynamical tool by which the argument of the periapsis, uh, little omega, is constricted to the minor plane using the mechanics of the dove cosi effect. So Trujillo and Shepard suggested that a massive outer solar system perturber may exist that restricts little omega for the inner or cloud objects, which are icy uh, pieces of space de debris in the or cloud. And the or cloud is a spherical shell of cometary bodies believed to surround the sun beyond the orbits of the outermost planets. So from there, then Madigan and McCourt presented a hypothesis uh, there, thereafter that the Kuiper belts could be formed by a cone-like structure, resulting in minor planets experiencing inclination instability and one to four, uh, around one to four galactic years ago. Uh, exponentially growing in inclination and evolving, evolving a narrow distribution in Little Omega between 40 degrees for very eccentric um, orbits and 70 degrees for lower eccentricities. So this is a simpler solution um, in comparison to the perturber. Uh, perturber hypothesis. So in 2016, uh, Caltech researchers Badigen and Brown put forth a research centered around purely mathematical evidence that supported the existence of Planet Nine as that perturber that Trujillo and Shepard suggested. So they chose uh, six KBOs from a set of 13 that are thought uh, to be clustered together from Planet Nine's uh, gravitational pull. 
Um, from this, uh, dissent ensued in the scientific community on the grounds of selection bias. So the Outer Solar System uh, Origin Survey, with the objective of determining observational biases from a sample, discovered more than 800 uh, trans-Neptunian objects, or TNOs. So then in 2019, Badiger and Brown published another paper that addressed the observational biases in longitude of the perihelion orbital pole in a comparison to the OSS-OS survey. However, uh, selection bias concerns have continued to circulate since. So in early uh, 2021, uh, Napier et al. claims that Batogen and Brown only chose objects observed in a small portion of the sky at a specific time during a specific year. So uh, Batogen and Brown then published a new set of results in late 2021, adjusting their existing sample link techniques with new clustering data. So Batogen and Brown outlined the implementation of a Gaussian process Sess emulator in a Markov chain Monte Carlo analysis. So this process is applied to a new set of KBOs that's obtained by limiting um, objects to those with a semi-major axis between um, 150 and 1,000 astronomical units and perihelion distance uh, greater than 42 astronomical units, uh, leaving a smaller sample of 11 objects. So Batogen and Brown thus found that there was a uh, no reason to there was a reason to uphold their results and update analysis from previous work while outlining the parameters of Planet Nine as they reflected a uh, simulation data. So in recent years, uh, various groups such as Janat et al. and Cole implemented statistical techniques that have progressed the understanding of the three body problem significantly. Uh, these uh, models suggest uh, the results of a single object with respect to a binary stellar system called a binary single encounter. And uh, here on the right um, is a table outlining the objects used by various teams. So you'll see Batogen and Brown, Napier et al. and um, uh, Will and I. And uh, it's just to show the differences between the certain bodies used um, in each uh, simulation and paper. All right, so getting on to our research and our contributions here, uh, we applied Mathematica uh, using the n-body simulation in there. Uh, they had nine of the 14 KBOs that we studied stored in their data so we just utilized those and created an object for planet nine and ran the simulation in there it was that had 11 bodies when we included planet nine and then when we took planet nine out it was a 10 body simulation um now when we uh printed the final positions of these bodies at the end of the simulation we saw that there was actually a, a difference uh, out in the fifth decimal place between the positions of certain bodies. Um, between uh, comparing when the planet nine and it was included and when it was not. Now, this is only possible because uh, Mathematica stores so many decimal places, and that's its greatest strength. But the drawback here was the fact that that the um, orbits of these objects were only stored in uh, Cartesian coordinates and thus the orbits that were produced were circular um, rather than elliptical, which uh, all of these objects have very high uh, eccentricities. So we worked then with the Universe Sandbox um, where we implemented JPL, uh, JPL small body database data uh, and we input the orbital parameter information for 14 different KBOs that um, we listed on the table on the previous slide there. Um, now, uh, here you see the system for two different perspectives of the system containing planet nine with these various KBOs, the sun and these objects uh, at the end of a 500 year propagation period. Now, Universe Sandbox itself is programmed as a realistic physics-based simu uh, space simulator with unrivaled graphics. As such, and due to the required computing power for maintaining the graphical performance, it's only really necessary for the program to store around three to four significant figures, which limits its usefulness as a tool for studying high precision perturbations. Now, we would have needed to see those same differences we saw in Mathematica. So while it's a great tool for kind of seeing how this uh, these 
uh, systems look, we didn't see a difference when Planet Nine was not included in these positions and the velocity data. Now, uh, we moved on to an analysis of stability uh, by programming a Lagrange contour plot uh, for Planet Nine, Sun, and point mass system. Now, uh, you'll see the, the product there on the right, uh, but there in the bottom left, you see uh, a graph kind of of the, or a sketch of the three body system uh, in a rotating frame of reference. Now this frame is not inertial, but the system can still be analyzed as the sun and planet nine are motionless in this frame. Uh, the equal spacing and the value of mu equal to 0.1 is represented by the contour lines. Now this is true for every planet in the system, uh, in the solar system, and there's a proof for that, but uh, it takes up multiple pages and couldn't quite fit it here. Um, so you'll have to take our word for it now. But uh, here, capital R is the distance between our planet nine and the sun, which came out to be around 280 astronomical units. Uh, and we found that to be the case in universe sandbox as well. So we use that value there. Um, now mu is our scaling constant. Uh, that is the gravitational constant times mass of the sun as a mass of the point, uh, point mass over the uh, total mass. And here, just from the contour plot itself, we can determine the dynam dynamics of the system. Lagrange points one, two, and three are at saddle points and are in line with the planet and the sun. Uh, Lagrange points four, four and five reside at local maxima. And if you were to plot these points, you'd see uh, the production of equilateral triangles between the sun, planet nine, and Lagrange points four and five, which are off the x-axis. Um, so those 60 degree angles there kind of uh, represents the system in a way. Now, analyzing differences in final posi uh, positions of the KBOs from the two body simulation with those from the three body simulation indicate a slight perturbation of orbits. Uh, now we investigated the discrepancies, uh, the KBO data used in Badgerton and Brown's research. Uh, with Napier's research to find that in total there are 14 KBOs that satisfy the parameters given by Badgerton and Brown in their most recent paper, despite the fact that they only used 11. Uh, the contour plot created in Python gives a good view of the stability regions in the three body system, um, including the Sun, Planet 9, and smaller KBO. But we don't have conclusive results on Planet Nine's existence, obviously, uh, but we have a better idea of how Planet Nine theory fits in our solar system through simulations and dynamic studies. Now, for future research, we hope to make use of additional computational tools such as Mercury 6 perturbation code or the development of a new code capable of storing more precise data uh, that's still able to produce elliptical orbits. Um, uh, we like to use Mercury 6 as a more robust aperture through which the system can be evaluated and observed. But just in general, um, these things are going to take time and uh, more research into this area is, is a good sign. Thank you. So I hope that uh, got everyone interested to hear more uh, about their, their fascinating uh, honors research this this year. So our next uh, presentation, um, this one will be live, will be uh, Megan Liu and Philip Wellington. Um, Megan and Philip uh, are interested in uh, the challenge we face today in terms of uncertainty around university enrollment and this um, for this reason, they developed a dynamic model uh, to explore a variety of possibilities. Oh, I, I see Dr. Masterson's hand is raised. Do, do you have a question? Uh, I just have a comment about uh, the K KAM theory uh, oh, that sure. stands for Kalmogorov, Arnold, and Moser. I comment about Jurgen Moser. Jurgen Moser was a mathematician born in what was one 
Germany, East Prussia in 1928 and managed to escape uh, and eventually became the head of uh, the Quran Institute of Mathematical Sciences, where he developed not just you know, uh, his contribution to KM theory, but was a major contributor to uh, nonlinear uh, you know, Fourier analysis, otherwise known as inverse scattering theory. Uh, one of his key papers, the uh, paper on, on solutions, periodic solutions of the Cordovague de Vries equation. The Cordovague de Vries equation is an equation that it can be used to describe uh, shallow uh, waves that are solitary waves in, in deep water, like, like tsunami type waves, but also periodic solutions. Uh, so, uh, Jurgen Moser was a uh, great mathematician. He was the head of the Courant Institute of Mathematical Sciences in the late 60s, early 70s. He eventually left uh, you know, the U.S. and uh, returned to Switzerland, where he uh, finished his career. But uh, we should also give credit to, to Jurgen, an incredible mathematician. I saw him speak at Quran Institute in 1975. A great man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that interesting um, addition about Sia, certainly a, a very significant mathematician. Okay, so now uh, Megan and Philip, take it away. Thank you, Father Larry C. Uh, thank you for everyone coming here. Um, so I'm just going to be sharing my screen as I speak. Oh, oops, sorry about that. Oh no. Um, can everybody see my screen? Perfect. Okay, um, I can actually use this online version, which will be better. So I will let Philip start off. All right, there we go. Good afternoon, everybody. So we, Megan and I, we did our research on, and, and, and our title would be Elementary Model of University Student Retention. Um, of course, we are part of the junior seminar class as Father Laracy just um, introduced us. Next slide, please. So um, we're going to give you some background, the background and the question. Um, basically, the concept of student enrollment um, has been extensively studied in management enrollment settings. Um, a very detailed approach to decision making process. It might be a little overwhelming because of the complexity of the actual problem. So a suggestion of the way to model the problem will be explored in the optimal enrollments through the use of mathematical techniques. Um, numerical simulations, we actually put, uh, we put together using flows, we use stocks, internal feedback loops, time delays, and table functions to help in studying student enrollment dynamics. Um, the model assumes that basically the, the decision should be made every year to determine how many students to admit and from there, the students are classified based on their academic qualifications, whether or not they're a commuter or they're going to stay on campus, uh, the program of study, or any other characteristics during the admissions decisions. Um, next, please. Here we have, here we basically have the data that we used. Um, and you can see that we have the first time incoming class, um, incoming freshman class from the year of 2017. We went back to 2017 because actually that was the year in which um, I, I came in a long time ago, but Megan, her freshman year was 2017. Um, and we went to, here we see that the undergrad, here goes the undergraduate fre um, freshman class that came in, including also the graduate class that came in. Um, in total and here goes the incoming freshmen of the projected years so such as 2020 uh two which will be in the fall 2023 we didn't have 2024 because it wasn't uh basically in our research there wasn't a projection for 2024 but it said that they projected that the year of 2025 would be the largest incoming freshman class that will come in um and that should just you know, basically more of the details in that data table. Next slide, please. So the objective today, um, Megan's gonna take you guys further. 
um, and talk about the mathematics used to investigate the problem with the equations um, that we created and used. Uh, also the software that was used to create the model and just give some also some insights, some insights in the fear of the uncertainty due to certain factors. So some insights and in how that may affect our model or what we made so it wouldn't affect and just some future ideas. So now I will leave you in the hands of Megan. Thank you, Philip. So um, basically in uh, the methods in producting our research, we see that the system dynamic approach can usually be adopted to construct a suitable simulation model to be used to determine the complex and the dynamic interactions between the flows of the students, particularly at Zeno Hall University. Um, and then we also believe that the simulation model will provide a very meaningful and insightful data where the exploration uh, of the practical applicability is not necessarily just restricted to the Seton Hall University. So based on the equations that we have here, um, the variables that we calculate uh, using the method below uh, for so for a total amount of students, we have a number of freshmen, a number plus a number of sophomore, plus a number of juniors and plus a number of seniors. And also additionally, we have FTIC, which stands for first time in college. The remote flow um, can be represented by the time that they enrolled and the population um, of the first time uh, in college. And we also uh, later further in our research, we used uh, some uh, rationale to determine the following year's enrollment rates where the students uh, population uh, are uh, considered as the flows that are calculated the same way from previous years. So um, on to our next slide right here. This is a, 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 a model that we created using Benson, where it's a software showing the supporting continuous si simulation. Um, right now, this is what we have so far uh, with the advanced version. Of course, there is a lot more variables that in, we could input into the model, but so far we have not gathered uh, enough of data uh, and percentage uh, to be able to input it to the model where it could generate more graphs. Um, so you could see that um, in our model right here, we have started starting from um, uh, the beginning where uh, uh, students apply being admitted and we're here uh, based on the incoming class it's based uh, just based on the students that are accepted who decided to admit there is still a possibility of uncertainty where even though the students choose to admit but they did not mean they will be uh, enrolling in the university and again going into our freshman year we could see that uh, after a uh, freshman year first year going to our second year there could be uh, numbers can change based on students either pass or fail in a school or maybe even drop out or maybe transfer um, that is something that we also will be looking further into by gathering more data um, and then that applies to the same for sophomore junior year and senior year and then after senior uh, be, uh, graduating. So this is just a simple uh, model uh, flow showing uh, what it looks like starting from the first year to senior year within the four years. Of course, there is a lot uh, more possibilities where there could be a fifth year seniors, um, but that is also something that we have to look into, gather data to be uh, able to provide more information on. Um, so uh, basically uh, the flows in here we use the ordinary differential equations and basically be able to graph the changes in the student enrollment. Um, so basically, just to quickly jump into our conclusion right here, um, our conclusion is basically uh, saying that our focus was to uh, produce a simulation model that will help in the data records during the university enrollment of students, but of course uh, there is a lot more further work that we would uh, improve uh, further in our research. First, number one, we would definitely gather more data uh, as uh, Father Larazi has uh, helped us in uh, recommending going into the institutional uh, research here on campus um, to be able to uh, gather more data and provide a better graph and model. And of course uh, that brings us to our second point by running the model 
uh, uh, producing more additional uh, grass uh, with the resulting output. And last but not least, uh, Father Laracy also recommended us to do uh, run our student uh, retention model by using the linear programming. And here goes all the references, literally all the references that we use so far um, in doing our paper and our research. And we would just like to say thank you again to, you know, this would not be, this this would not have happened without Bob Laracy. His knowledge, every time we ask him a question, as said by former students as well, um, exacting attention to detail, it's definitely been an inspiration and definitely kept our work on target when we want to go off target. Um, and we also like to thank Seton Hall and the Department of Mathematics for giving us the opportunity to explore and basically enhance our critical thinking skills to the analysis of the problems in the dynamic systems. And we're also grateful for the insightful comments offered by Megan Lou's dad, Dr. Lou. He was, um, his generosity and expertise have improved the study in numerous ways and saved us from also many errors. Thank you. Thank Great work. Thank you very much. Well done. Does anyone have any questions for Megan and Phil? Well, all I'll say is that the, um, you know, administrators don't have as rosy a, a scenario as you have for uh, future enrollment. So if yours comes out true, they'll be doing uh, hand springs. Thank you. Dr. Marlowe, do you have a question? <clears throat> More a comment that <clears throat> you guys are to be congratulated for tackling a problem that doesn't have guiding physical guidelines, parameters, rules, constraints. Uh, people unfortunately don't behave by ordinary differential equations usually except for certain physical processes. So very good start. Modeling is hard. Yes, definitely. Um, so uh, uh, basically the start of this research was that um, there was this article that I get to read um, online where it talks about if you were the principal, then how would you be able, able to manage how many students you do enroll? So that's why I bought the idea that this is such an interesting topic. And so far, I don't think in Seno you know, Hall we have done something like this. So I'm glad to be one of the ones to be able to do it. Very good. Thank you, Megan and Philip. OK, and uh, now we'll have Michael Catley and Chloe Burke. Uh, Michael and uh, Chloe are working off an, an important paper by Benzinger, Burns and Palmore on complex chaotic uh, dynamics and Newton's method. Um, Benzinger, Burns and Palmore considered one parameter families of Julius sets that arise from Newton's method in the complex domain, and they were able to show the existence of bifurcation points where zeros coalesce or change from attractors to repellers, uh, where chaos emerges. And uh, Michael and Chloe have uh, done some uh, very interesting work extending uh, this in a more general way, and I'll let them explain. All right, thank you for the introduction, uh, Father Laracy. I'm just gonna uh, get the PowerPoint squared away. Can yeah. everyone see what's uh, shared? Yes. OK, good. So as Father Laracy said, um, our work was pretty much geared towards generalizing some um, work done in Palmore's paper on um, coalescing of roots bifurcation observed in a few classes of polynomials. So starting off with Newton's method of approximation, it is used 
To approximate the x-intercepts or zeros of a function, f of x, that cannot be found using standard techniques. It's based on the geometry of a curve using its tangent lines, and it typically starts with an initial guess known as x1, which is then calculated to get f of x1 equal to y1, and a tangent line is then drawn at y equals f of x at the point x1, y1, and where the tangent line would intersect with the x-axis will be defined as x2, and this process would continuously repeat until we reach our initial function's um, x-intercept. So we've analyzed Newton's method when it's used on two different families of complex functions. For the first function, we have defined z and d to be elements of the complex realm, and n is an element of the positive natural numbers. And for our second family, we have that z is an element for complex numbers and alpha and k are elements of real numbers. So just some definitions. The filled Julia set of G is the set of z for which the forward orbits by G do not blow up to infinity. The basins of attractions for Z naught for G is the set of Z such that the forward orbits of Z by G converge to a fixed point Z naught. The discriminant of F is a polynomial P such that P of Z equals zero if and only if F has a multiple root. The exceptional set, which consists of those Z that such that the sweet sequence G of N of Z is the composition of G times Z of n fold iterates of G does not converge to a zero of F. And lastly, the Newton map of F, the function G such that G of X of n uh, equals X of n minus F of X of n over F prime X of n for all n. So just to clarify, the G is a, um, is a uh, iterating map. So, and in our case, we're iterating the Newton map. So, so recall that our first family was something pretty reminiscent of the formula for z to the n plus one minus one, because we have, um, we know that we could factor that as z minus one times z to the n plus z to the n minus one and so on up to z squared plus z plus one. It's just that now we're introducing this sort of phase shift parameter um, acting as that constant term in the second factor where d is just varying in the complex plane. And our, our powers of n aren't going to be any um, uh, complex numbers where we have to deal with complex exponentiation or anything like that. So we're just considering positive natural number powers. So the way that this is generalizing Palmore's work to begin with is that he considered the case of this function for n equals two. And um, what we're doing in this um, here is considering n equals three and discussing the n equals four case and so on. So what he observed was that as n was fixed at two and d was varying throughout um, not throughout the complex plane, but D just varying on the real line. As D approached a certain value, the um, basins of attractions corresponding to each of the roots uh, coalesced into one basin corresponding to the root of um, a root with multiplicity greater than one. So in other words, when D reached a certain point where that polynomial had a multiple root, that corresponded to Basson's co um, coalescing into one. And that was in fact the only D for which that happened. So we, we considered um, to what extent can we get this to happen with N equals three and so on. So what we needed to look at first was to what extent does the polynomial, the second factor um, have a multiple root? And we get this information by looking at the discriminant of that polynomial. So we suspect that we'll get coalescing of roots phenomena if and only if the discriminant um, of that second factor is zero. So what if, if we look at n equals three, then what happens is um, 
the discriminant in this case will look like the quadratic um, presented, and it's going to have roots at these two complex numbers. So what's good about this is that the roots occur on a straight line in the plane so that um, they only differ by their imaginary part. And when we parameterize D so that um, we can kind of see what those bastions look like as that parameter D varies, we can just vary it along that line in the plane. So, um, and when we do that, we're actually going to hit those two points and get possibly two values for which there's a coalescing of roots because we're going along a line that has both of the roots on it of the discriminant. So, um, so we pretty much take D and turn it into an expression where the um, part of the imaginary part is varied. And when that K value hits four root two or minus four root two, then that's where we see um, the coalescing of roots. So um, for instance, when K is negative 10, we have these are the plots of the Bassins. And um, these were produced in Mathematica with the list density plot command. So we did the Newton map of our family to um, every point pretty much in this two by two or this four by four window in the plane. And if the successive applications, compositions of the Newton map um, ended up seeming to converge really close to any of the roots, then they were colored a certain value. So note that there's four regions. Um, we're considering a uh, cortic in this case. So it's going to have four roots if they're all distinct. And um, so that's why at negative 10, there's going to be four roots. And uh, note as K gets closer and closer to the value for which that second factor has a multiple root, these regions seem to be coalescing into one. And the closeness of color hue is indicating that. So, um, and after we pass that first point where it had the multiple root, in between k equals negative four root two and k equals four root two, we see um, that those four bastards reemerge again, and that corresponds to the fact that there isn't a multiple root; they're all distinct roots. And now at this time, the bastard on the bottom seems to be getting more and more closer in shade to the uh, region corresponding to the purple root. So, um, and then when K gets to four root two, then those bastions emerge again as expected. And then after that, um, four bastions emerge again. So that's the bifurcation for N equals three. And we considered the N equals four case two, but the roots, you know, the roots of the cubic polynomial were much more complicated, and we only included the n equals three case because of that. But a very similar phenomena happens with the n equals four case, and so on. So moving on to family number two, we are considering the function f of alpha k of z is equal to z plus alpha to the alpha times z minus one to the k. This is the same family from Palmore, but it has an extra power parameter k. The Julia sets, which are the boundaries of the basins, are what is going to be bifurcating this time. We are not looking at the basins, but we are looking at the boundaries for when alpha is equal to one half and when k is varying between negative infinity and positive infinity. And in this image right here, this is for when k is equal to negative two. You can see by the axes that this figure is very, very small. Uh, ranging in the y-axis from negative 0.3 to positive 0.3. And you can also see that the edges of this figure are sharp. They kind of resemble like a pine cone structure. So the Mathematica plots were created by iterating the Newton map of the points of the families with the varying k value over and over again until these points blew up. And the colors on these figures show how many iterations with done, with the ledger being at 100, showing the black figures in all of the four of these pictures. 
And the Julia sets are the boundaries that are between the black figures and all of the other colors. So you can see that as K is approaching closer to zero between negative one and zero, that what was once that pine cone structure is starting to grow and expand and they're turning more circular and they're also starting to um, collide more and more into each other and blowing up and growing the closer that we approach zero. So many values between zero and one half for K were um, tested, but plots of both the Julia sets and the basins uh, yielded no attractive behavior. But you can see just shortly right after at when K is equal to 0.53, this figure is starting to reemerge. And as we keep approaching closer to positive infinity, the structure that was once blown up in between that negative one to zero range is starting to shrink back down and it's starting to sharpen once again and become that pine cone structure once again, as you can see when K is equal to negative six or six, positive six, my bad. So, um, after looking at those two bifurcations, what we what we tried to do and what we did in part a little bit is generalize the phenomena that occurred between the uh, family that Palmore first introduced, where it was sort of like the um, Z to the N minus one formula. And um, we looked at more general Julia sets of the uh, the family, the other family that Palmore considered, which was pretty much the same thing as uh, the F sub alpha K family we looked at, except um, the there was no power parameter K. It was just Z plus alpha to the alpha times Z minus one. So um, pretty much we, we, we kind of stemmed the bifurcation phenomena that occurred to those general families. Um, another thing that we want to do is study to what extent for certain alpha and for certain K for the second family, can we get nice Julia sets for which if we were to um, look at how the elements of the Julia set are distributed along a certain curve, we can model them using certain distributions. So um, in doing that, we have to take the pre-images of certain points and that yielded a quadratic recurrence that was sort of difficult to look at in its general form with alpha and K in it. So um, finding certain values of alpha and K for which we can do a similar thing to what Palmore did is of future interest. And finally, um, finding for the first family, when we looked at the N equals two case and N equals three case, it was a fairly simple way to vary D in the plane so that it had two coalescing or three coalescing of roots. But for n equals four and n equals five and so on, um, I mean, we suspect that there's a way to vary D on a certain curve so that it just hits through all those points in the plane for which it has multiple roots. And um, finding a generally easy way to find that parameterization is also of considerable interest. So that concludes our work and what also like to thank Father Laracy for his continuous support and providing of as um, another in our class, another person in our class said like continuous flowing of resources for our project and it was really helpful and he was like a, a really excellent source for us and our junior seminar classmates for their continuous support and all right here's our bibliography our references and Thank you guys. If you guys have any questions. Please. Great work, Michael and Chloe. Very proud of you. Uh, uh, you really entered into a, a, a challenging uh, area and um, did uh, did fantastic research. And uh, I hope that you'll continue um, in, in that future work that you discussed. Um, looks like we have a question or comment from Dr. Marlowe. I think you're still muted. I think you're muted, Dr. Marlowe. 
first example, in the first example, you're getting a merger of two basins because you have a double root. If you had a root of higher degree, would you expect to see more basins merge? Higher multiplicity? Um, I yeah, I yeah, I appreciate the question, and I think um, that that was definitely something I considered. That's something we considered when we were plotting these. Um, but what I, I I would suspect that there would be, um, yeah, that the general idea of like if there's a root of multiplicity n, let's say, then there would be n bastions coalescing into one. I would totally expect that. Um, I would have to consider polynomials for which. Yeah, that examples won't be happen. will have to be constructed in reverse. I expect, but that's a different question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. OK, excellent. Thank you, Michael and Chloe. So this brings us to our last presentation. Um, by uh, this will be by um, Camilla and Layla. Uh, they could not be with us today due to work obligations, and so they made a recording. Uh, you know, with with all the groups, I I, I always insist that they pursue a project in the seminar that's of interest to them. Uh, and uh, when Layla and Camilla approached, they said, we're very interested in fashion. And sure enough, they uh, formulated a very interesting project um, applying some fundamentals of dynamical systems to uh, cycles of, of fashion. We're, we're all familiar with things coming in and out of fashion. So uh, now I think Professor Wager will play their video. And again, just let me know if you could hear it um, as it's as it's playing. Just give me a, thumb, a thumbs up. You guys. All right, let me try one more time. Um, what we did was now? we read through and outlined okay. already some mathematical models about fashion trends, and then we're going to talk about a model that we actually created ourselves. All right, so first, uh, fashion is important because it is in almost everything. Um, basically, something to understand and to know right off the bat is that the fashion industry is extremely profitable, and what we are concerned with is making it more profitable by hopefully being able to predict certain fashion trends and when certain styles are going to be popular again um, or when they're going to go out of style. So again, this is just our purpose. Um, we're going to be talking about different mathematical models and the theoretical framework for the fashion process. So what is fashion? Fashion is a way of behaving that is temporarily adopted by discernible proportion of members of a social group because that chosen behavior is perceived as socially appropriate for the time and situation. We're adopting symbols and cultivating identity. We're using self-expression and societal acceptance, and we're going to go into people who are not following society and how they reflect our mathematical models. So the fashion phenomenon, we have continuity and it's styles that attributes that are only incrementally different, such as skirt lengths, heel lengths, those all change throughout the years. And we're just gonna show an example of that later on. Um, cyclical, um, the phenomenon is adopting styles that are progressively more extreme in one direction. And then at later points in time, more extreme in the opposite. Long sh skirts going into, um, extremely short skirts again as another example this is one of the main things that happen in style with skirts and it's not regular in frequency or at amplitude so it's a speed of shift is variable so this is the example we have that shows that in 1915 we had the long skirt but then again in the 1975s it's the same thing and you can see how it changes the ups and downs of the hemline and it's important to know that for our research because we needed to be able to understand that fashion trends will come back no matter what the product is. Again, the cyclicality, the return of Y2K, this was the early 2000s and now it came back not only 20 years later. 
OK, and some other fashion phenomena we have are um, classic trends. So this is cyclicality in the long run. These are basically trends that never go out of style. Um, they're always fashionable and they're always attractive to most people. Um, and then we're going to talk about some fashion turning points. So this is the progression of a trend until a point of excess when it's no longer functional. Um, and then the trend takes a turn and goes in an opposite direction. And then lastly, um, like what Layla mentioned, we have individual adherence to trends. So these are people who might purposely not follow a trend because they don't want to participate in things that are socially acceptable. Um, so these are people that would go against the trend. And again, just an example of a classic fashion trend, pinstripe suits have always been in style and um, they likely will always stay in style. Okay, and then we have fashion processes. So basically, um, Really quick, what we want to get out of this is that there are internal perspectives and then external views of fashion. Um, so internal obviously focuses on fashion as a self-contained phenomenon, but external um, may, it reflects more on like broader changes of like external factors and influence. But external models are limited in their ability to explain and predict fashion trends. They're simply just like a little bit like too much um, variables. So we are going to be focusing on internal perspectives. OK, and then we have uh, contracts. So these are just um, <clears throat> different like types of influence with fashion trends. First, we have prior preferences. So this is someone's uh, fashion preference before any social influence comes into play. Then there is selective influence such as uh, mass media or one social circle. Um, and then we have group membership and conformity. So if you identify with a group, then you are likely going to adopt that group's fashion style. Um, individuality and differentiation. This um, this is just expressing your individuality through an adopted fashion trend. So you might wear something that's trending, but you're going to make it your own. Um, desire to be current. I put keeping up with the Joneses because this is just kind of keeping up with whatever's hot in the moment. Um, and then lastly, we have attitude toward change. Uh, toward change. So this is people who resist fat fashion trends, people who might not tolerate the new trends enough to participate in them or taking fashion risks and like kind of stepping outside your comfort zone. And these constructs have an impact on fashion because of their relationship to the fashion decision process, of course. So the mathematical <clears throat> models we're going to use is the creation of the Omega ma matrix and it has the positive and real characteristic roots. So these kind of um, time the path of the monotonic and there's constraints which induce the cyclic fashion and there's the dominant route and it increasingly extreme styles into no longer functional and there's the monotonic or lean toward constant styles. So there's negative real roots as well, which is the continuous fluctuation of time path of fashion adoptions. And the complex roots, which is the continuous oscillations of time paths of fashion adoptions. So the patterns based on Omega is the bandwagon model, the diffusion type models, the saw model, and the trickle down model theory. Oh, the trickle down theory. So the bandwagon model, it assumes individuals positively in influenced by undifferentiated mass of de demand of an item, and it doesn't recognize an individual's influence. They're symmetric um, with real root positive off diagonal elements. So as we can see in the um, I the matrix, sorry. Um, we can rule out there's no complex roots and the time paths cannot diverge. So there's no constraint induced cyclical fashions and there's an inadequate representation. And then for the diffusion type models, we assume two homogeneous classes of individuals, the innovators and the imitators, which we will also get more into with our own model. And there's a pattern of social influence represented by partition non-negative matrix. So as we can see, there's D1, D2, and D3, and the square diagonal matrix reflects independence of innovators from influence, and there's also the imitators being influenced only positively and equally. Only positive roots are the imitators displayed that are monotonic, class classic fashions, while innovators remain at initial styles. It's an inadequate model. All right, and then we have the snob model. So this one assumes that the individuals are negatively influenced by um, undifferentiated mass demand of style. 
Um, so there's equal negative influence on everyone else. So this one, um, the magnitude of the dominant root is greater than one, so that rules out classic fashions. Um, it is a real and symmetric matrix. If you see um, it's symmetric along the, the, the main diagonal, so that means there's no complex uh, roots, so that also rules out the continuous fashion cycle. Um, it permits constraint-induced fashion styles, but still it is an inadequate model. And then lastly, we have the trickle down model, the trickle down theory. Um, so, so this one is about social influence patterns between like three social classes. So there's the middle class, the class that is um, immediately higher, and then the class that is immediately lower. Um, this creates a tri-diagonal matrix with zero elements everywhere but the main diagonal and the diagonals above and below. Um, because of that, negative roots will not exist. Um, so then the discontinuous fluctuations of fashion trends is ruled out. Um, the matrix is not symmetric, so we cannot rule out the complex roots. This is a better, more general representation than previous models because it is less restrictive. So the author's conclusion is that the fashion process is um, important to the market phenomenon. It's conceptualized a fashion process is under-researched and there needs to be more research to actually create more models that are adequate to explain full range of the trends. Many, many factors and constructs go into this just because we need to take people's preferences. You have to get so much data. And the next step would be examining models empirically. So we need to explain frameworks to consider role and prices of the, the role of prices and in income, mass media influence, role of fashion designers, manufacturers and retailers. All right, so this is the model that Layla and I created. What we did was we took the Romeo and Juliet love affair model and we adapted it, modified it. Um, so basically the Romeo and Juliet love affair model consists of two individuals, Romeo and Juliet, and their love for each other depends on each other. Um, so if Romeo loves Juliet, then Juliet is going to love Romeo or vice versa or the opposite. So um, we re replaced Romeo and Juliet with Layla and Camilla. And um, L of T represents Layla's feelings towards Camilla's outfit at time T. And then C of T represents um, Camilla's feelings towards Layla's outfit at time T. Positive values of LT and CT would represent attraction and the negative values would represent dislike. And then zero would mean indifference. Um, so this is just going to represent the interdependent influence on fashion sense. So then we derived these equations, DL over DT equals AC, and then DC over DT equals negative BL, where A and B are parameters that are real and positive. So with that, we end up with a diagonal matrix with eigenvalues, positive or negative, the square root of ABI. Um, you see we have our matrix right here on the right. And since our eigenvalues are complex, then the fixed point is either circle or spiral. So then we used Euler's formula as highlighted below. And you can go to the next slide. <laughs> Um, it's OK. Um, so when we use Euler's formula, um, it shows us that the real part of the eigenvalues actually is equivalent to zero, which implies a steady state, um, which means that the fixed point is neutrally stable and it must be a center. So with the graphs, we can see the initial conditions and parameters. So with the first graph, we see that L0 is equal to 3.4, 3.14. So we start at that point. And then for Camilla's, it would be at negative 0.5. And since we are looking at their um, likes and dislikes, we can see that when I start to not like a fashion, Camilla does. So we are, in, she's imitating me as I am seeing it. I don't like it. So it's just showing how different fashion trends can work if the imitator does not like what the other is wearing. And then we also have the graph the other graph and Camilla can you take this one yeah so this is um the face portrait again this is just showing this this is just a visual based on our initial conditions and parameters our parameters again are real and positive and our initial conditions so Layla starts at a positive value and Camilla starts at a negative value uh, meaning that she has feelings of attractions and I have feelings of dislike um, and then this is just the face portrait that it produces again you see that it is um, circle we said it was either going to be circle or spiral. 
And then conclusions. So um, our model represents the interdependency between two individuals in terms of fashion sense. So Layla and I are both imitators and innovators at the same time. Um, one of us starts off wearing something and depending if I like it, then I'm going to wear it. And then if she doesn't like it, then she's not going to wear it. And it just goes around in a cycle like that. Um, and we can also probably take our model and adapt it to fit groups instead of individuals. Um, and again, I, as I mentioned, disliking one's outfit is a form of negative selective influence and then attraction to an outfit is a form of positive selective influence. Um, so again, main conclusion here is that um, individuals will continue to style themselves based on each other, creating a cyclic fashion trend that depends on the aforementioned interdependency. So this is kind of like a bi-directional influence. Um, but again, just, just to keep in mind, making models for fashion processes is extremely difficult just because there are so many so many variables and constructs and factors to keep in mind. Um, there is mass media, there's also income, prices of things, um, culture, things of that nature, but we did our best to create our own model. Um, so yeah. Thank you. So Layla and Camilla try to model my sense of fashion but it introduced the singularity into the equations and so it blew the whole thing up. So that concludes the, the junior seminar presentations. Thank you, Father Harris. <clears throat> okay, so I believe that concludes our uh, our sessions for today. Uh, Tara, do we have a um do we have a breakout room or something for I, I, was, I was thinking that we could join the uh, full time faculty team. Okay. Yep. So we'll start a okay. meeting there and then uh, we'll talk about our, our winners. Okay. Yeah, uh, Tara, if there are any guests that you want to invite, you'll have to invite them explicitly. Okay. Okay. And just a general comment. Uh, I'd like to thank all versatile and you know, accomplished student presenters for their presentations and I'd also like to thank uh, those who have played an organizing role here in this meeting Professor Sackerman, Wager, Upman, and uh, Laracy who have really <coughs> helped, helped make this meeting. Well, thank we'd you. be remiss if we didn't mention Dr. Marlowe who has helped cover uh, some of the meetings of the Peterson group for Tara as well and we appreciate him stepping in even though he is under, under no obligation to do so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we'll repair to the uh, full-time faculty room. Yeah, that sounds good. See what's going on. There was something, wasn't it? That's for sure. I don't think we're in the right place. Uh, yeah, where where do we go now? <laughs> Direct us, <future> leader. <laughs> <laughs> Still have a recording here going on, and I think we have to get that stopped too. Did he leave now? Okay. Looks like we have our. Who else is here? Supposed to join another team here? I don't see the full-time faculty team. 
but of course I'm not a full time faculty member anymore. OK, let me uh, let me leave this meeting temporarily and see what's going on. If there's any other meeting set up. 